amazing guys. We've got this great panel coming up. We got Mowgli, we got Robert C. Clark, we got Jerry Whiting, Suni Chiba DJ Short, and Don Worshafter making up the tail end. Fantastic to have everyone here. So, so while these guys get organized. Perfect. What a what an honor to be moderating this panel with such uh, some smart, smart, amazing breeders and geneticists on it, and cannabis researchers. So I'm going to start out by uh, asking everyone on the panel to just uh, give us a brief one minute introduction. Tell us who you are, what you've been working on in the last year, and uh, we'll get this thing on the go. Once again, our panel on securing the rights to genetics. Go ahead. You can start us off, Mowgli. Hello, my name is Mowgli. I'm the Chief Scientific Officer of a Portland company called Phylos Bioscience. And all we do is study the cannabis genome. We're sequencing thousands of different strains and working with the American Museum of Natural History to create a huge evolutionary map of how cannabis has evolved in the last 10,000 years. And we're working with a group called the Open Cannabis Project to take that data and use it to make sure that people don't patent strains so that the incredible diversity we have now continues to grow. Thank you very much, Mowgli. Uh, I think that's a good, uh, good words of advice to start. How about you, uh, Robert? What, do you, what, what have you been doing in the last year? Your new book is amazing, by the way. Well, thank you, thank you. Um, the last year I've been working with Mowgli on things. And yep trying to work out my deepest research interest, which is the evolution of cannabis under domestication, really. And the only way I see to be able to do this is using DNA sequencing. So that's a big interest for me. I'll look forward to, to hearing more about that as the panel goes on. That sounds fascinating, man. And how about you, Jerry? What's, uh, what's keeping you busy these days? Uh, I own a small family business called the Blanc &E, and we specialize in CBG. Talk very close to the mic. CBD bridge strains and uh, heirloom uh, land races. And so the last year I have focused on uh, a seed bank that I uh, have amassed by talking my peers out of their film canisters that they've held on to all these years. Uh, and the second project is something uh, I call Althea, after the Grateful Dead song. It is a um, software framework for storing and sharing uh, cannabis data, including market data, genetic data, and um, chemical profiles. That's fantastic, and it's about time we start to not only come out of the basements, but come out of our own little niches and start sharing this knowledge, because uh, it's, it's no good for all of us to be doing this research independently. How about you, uh, Sonny, what are you working on, man? Um, I'm doing a lot of breeding, breeding again, uh, bringing back a lot of my old strains like the Double Purple Dojo and the Black Cherry, but I'm also working with a lot of land races and hybrids. Uh, this past year, I've been doing a lot of politics in Oregon with Magley Homes. Uh, we are working on genetics and the laws in Oregon, trying to uh, make a craft industry and uh, research programs and breeding programs. Um, I'm also working on a book uh, about the colors of cannabis, uh, about the colors that we see in the gene pool. Um, other than that, just getting ready to uh, do, do, do a lot more breeding. Fantastic. Thank you. It's great to have you here. Uh, DJ, it's good to have you back as well. Normally you're sitting on the previous panel, so it's nice that uh, we got you on this one. What are you working on these days? Uh, what's catching your attention? Well, uh, I've just been uh, traveling, uh, taking care of uh, personal business. My father passed away in April. Uh, that's out of the way. Um, and so I just kind of been putting the pieces back together, uh, doing a little R&D. I did some seed sprout things and, and was able to finish them up with some people up here in Washington. Turned out uh, rather interesting. Uh, so just got my fingers in the dirt a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I can, I can see it. I like having a little dirt under my nails this time of year as well. Uh, Don, why don't you tell us uh, what uh, brings you to this panel? What's been going on with you now that you've moved back to uh, lovely Washington State? Well, let's see, in the last year... Oh. In, the, in the last year, I did move back to Washington. I was an aspirant into 502 and smashed against the wall like 7,000 other people who thought this new plan might actually make cannabis free. Uh, but I'm here because in the last year, or the last 25 years, whatever, I'm building a museum of cannabis and I have put together an incredible collection of apothecaries and med med medicinal bottles from 1830 to 1937 
We've gotten into a stash of bottles that were hidden away by a revenue agent in 1937. Rather than turned into the agency, he put them in his closet. And his widow sold them over the last 10 years. And we've put that collection pretty much back together and the data from it is amazing. We've also collected apothecaries from the pharmacists and the uh, uh, physicians who have their little cabinets of curiosities that that control substances things they kind of keep to themselves it's a very hidden network and we've penetrated it to be able to collect old apothecaries of cannabis that will knock your socks off and we're taking photographs of all this and we're about ready to publish this our first opening is going to be at the opening of the new dockside museum in Soto in two weeks and um, you look for the billboard off the I-5 of the people dancing on the trampoline and uh, that's your, your uh, new dispensary or uh, whatever, retail location. We're not dispensaries anymore. Anyhow, we're going to do a museum down there as a start, but we got uh, the potential to do something really amazing. They, these bottles blow everybody's minds. This is the, the, the hidden history, the stuff they tried to hide from us of how well our ancestors did on this amazing medicine. It's got implications in what we're talking about today because these bottles prove the intellectual property of our ancestors. This is what they took away from us. The indications, the cures that were claimed by these incredible doctors a hundred years ago match exactly what these pharmaceutical companies are trying to patent on us today. So that's why I'm here. Thanks a lot, Don. Much appreciated. It's great to have you here. Before we talk about what's left in the future in terms of genetics, I want to ask you guys a couple of questions about our genetic past of this amazing plant that we all know of. There's thousands of strains available out there. There's been theories that maybe there's only five or six original land races that all of these strains are bred with. I see some nodding here. I wonder in the genetic research that you guys are doing, if you guys have been able to, or if you have like, uh, anything from wild guests to some uh, scientific uh, information to share with us about what the origins are of all of these strains we have going here today. Do we know how many strains are at the base of these initially? Well, if you, you look at our latest evolutionary hypothesis for where cannabis in general came from, we, Mark Merlin, my co-author, and I support a, a two-species approach. And basically, there's cannabis sativa, which is European hemp, and all the rest of the cannabis in the world is some form of cannabis indica. It all has the potential to produce drugs, whether it was bred for it, selected for it or not. And that's, of, of this cannabis indica species, it's basically three subspecies. Cannabis indica, subspecies indica, that's the narrow leaf drug varieties that people commonly and erroneously call sativas. Um, that's the, the major amount the, this is what was everywhere in the world it was considered dope basically until the Afghan varieties came along and there are some species of indica called Afghanica the way we consider it now and this seems to fit pretty well with how the breeding has come together over the years we had one kind of weed that had a lot of diversity to it and then along came this uh, economically significant Afghan because it was shorter and faster and, and different and made great hybrids with the, the ones we already had and that's what we have today but we don't have the original varieties we used to have the land races or the early hybrids between them there are a few around we don't have the very same we have similar things and people are working with them and that's very positive but we need to recreate what we have now and think a little more about it and not just try to make uh, buds that look good in a bag. Is, is, that, is, is that Afghanica, what uh, Carl Hulig would have called a white leaf? Uh, white yes, leaf uh, indica? Broad leaf or wide leaf. Yeah. Yeah. But, but so, how many within cannabis indica, how many land races would you say it originally split into? How many distinct land races? Many, many, many. The, the ones that came down to us as important were Mexican and Colombian and Jamaican to a degree and Thai. These are all narrow leaf drug varieties, all true indicas. We, we call the broadleaf varieties indica largely because at the time Richard Schultes went to Afghanistan on behalf of the Brotherhood of Eternal Love, everything was considered to be a sativa at that point. 
the laws only prescribe sativa. So they tried a, the indica defense. But that was actually the Afghan defense. I just met that lawyer at a music festival. I just randomly started talking to him. It turned out he was the lawyer who brought the indica defense. He was an amazing guy. Well, there were a lot of them in different states all at the same time. And only two of them actually succeeded before Ernest Small published his paper and then it was over. So guys, so these high CBD varied varieties that we're seeing these days that you guys are breeding for, is that just a hemp strain or is there a true uh, hybrid or a cross going on there? Uh, is this still part of the uh, uh, Sativa Indica family of plants? So when I first started chasing CBD just three years ago, <clears throat> approximately one in 500 by lab results showed 4% CBD or more. Things like Harlequin. I collected every mutant I could get my hands on and had this, this sideshow as a garden. Over the last two years, you've seen people deliberately aim for CBD production as they breed. And that to me is true innovation as opposed to me too, me too, something else. So I think you've seen people move, the, the, my part of the world, the CBD part of the world, move beyond found art, something you stumbled across, and that only happened because people were doing cannabinoid profiles on what was just a bag of green before. But now you're seeing people deliberately breed for CBD. And what LeBlanc has bet heavy on this summer is what I call CBD hemp. So uh, there are breeders here in and other places who have taken hemp strains and in some cases ACDC or other things that have positive CBD and are, and some of my friends like Joy who come from the hemp world wave a finger at me, but I think there's a gradient in, in terms of the, of the genotypes. And my backyard is full of Jack and the Beanstalk, hemp stuff that looks different, short internodal stuff, and it's less than 0.3% THC. I have seen this breeder's, he has his own gas chromatography. I've gone through his handwritten in pencil journals of his stuff. Only two terps, you're seen in uh, care filing, but it's less than 0.3, 20, 30 to 1 up to 200 to 1. So this summer for me is a pheno hunt. The girls, they are a blooming. I use the sex test to pull out the boys. Thank you so much. And um, to me, it's all about creative, genetic, um, deliberate engineering. Not, oh, I have a boy, let's cross with the girl I can get my hands on. Now I have a catalog. No, that's sloppy <laughs> genetics. Right on. Uh, uh, Malgly, do you want to tell us a little bit about the uh, deep research that uh, Phylos is doing right now and uh, what you guys are finding in terms of our cannabis genome. Sure, so first of all, just one thing about the CBD. The CBD thing is, is really interesting to us genetically because um, I think a lot of people assume that these were hemp genes that got bred into the population, but we're seeing spontaneous CBD plants that are coming from crosses between pretty much all THC plants. So. One of the things we want to figure out is, I mean, what's, is it a mutation in the cannabinoid pathway that suddenly flips on the CBD synthase and flips off the THC synthase? Um, it's, just, it's just really interesting and unusual for a plant to have these sort of switch flipping pathways like that in, in its secondary metabolism. Um, the, one of the main things that we're finding though, studying the genome is, um, is that this is the, one of the, not only one of the most diverse plants on the planet, but it's one of the most genetically diverse species on, in the entire planet. Um, as, as Rob explains in his last book, cannabis followed humans everywhere they went as they colonized the planet. 10,000 years ago, it left Central Asia and it followed us everywhere. It diversified into different races, just like we did. And then all of these different races that had been a part in their land race homes and different indigenous communities, they all came back together into this genetic Brazil on the west coast of the United States and then in Holland. And there's just such incredible diversity that in fact just the, the mechanics of assembling the genome is a nightmare um, because every plant is so heterozygous. The chromosomes, the you know, you have chromosome seven from the mother and from the father. They should be largely identical, except for a few point mutations. They don't even co-assemble when you do the sequences. They're just so different. And it's that incredible diversity that makes it so we have so many amazing plants now. 
And, um, and, and I feel like we're just scratching the surface. All of those traits are out there. People are gonna be able to start bringing them together in really unusual combinations. I, I completely agree about just scratching the surface. Now I wanna ask you guys about some of the other minor cannabinoids. Uh, Sunny, uh, DJ, you guys have been breeding for a long time. There seems to be a lot of interest from the research community, I can tell you for sure uh, from my end, for CBC, CBG, THCB plants. Is, is CBD just the, the start of this frontier? Are we going to start seeing those high CBC, high CBG, THCB plants? I've referred to CBD for a while now as the new kid on the block. Yeah. And there will be other new kids on the block. Yeah. Uh, the, the research I've done, and I'm lacking in my chemistry, so forgive me. Uh, it starts with CBG, I believe, and then progresses from there. Um, and it ends with CBN. And a little side note, there are some people uh, finding medicinal quality in the CBN as well, especially for sleep. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know if that answers the question or not. No, no, that's good. And how about yourself? Are you seeing anything, Sunny, in terms of what breeding you I, guys are doing? I think the CBD is actually almost the old kid on the block. And at this point in time, we're looking at other, other we're looking at more, right now we're looking at THCV is what we're isolating. And we're seeing 4%, 7%, we're seeing these huge spikes in flower form. And that's what really matters when we take that into a lab to concentrate that. Don, I've been talking to, uh, I'll, I'll get right to you, Jerry. Don, I, I've been talking to a lot of uh, hemp breeders who for years have been breeding for material and, and for, uh, for oil, etc. They're now breeding for CBD specifically. That's kind of an evolution in terms of hemp production in Canada and certainly internationally, isn't it? Sure, but most of these breeders, if they know what they're doing, are back crossing these hemp varieties with great cannabis varieties and then in the second generation some of those plants will be close to the plants you're looking for and it takes years from there to get to to what people want. Um, it, it's quite complex but it's very well published and, and, it's, and I really am kind of perplexed why 15 years later our community hasn't caught up with the science on the plant. Yeah, I think we're just, uh, I think when you think about CBD, it's really, it was the first molecule I isolated by uh, by Meshulam, so the fact that we're just catching up to this uh, 50 years later is quite amazing. Jerry, you were going to add something to this? Yeah, I think you asked either one question or only half a question. Um, we're not only are excited about things like CBD and THCV, and the acid forms, uh, THCA is used for uh, spasms, muscle spasms, and also for some epileptics who don't find relief from CBD. The other half of the question, or the follow-up question, I hope, is about terpenes, because cannabinoids are one thing, uh, but the terps, I find, keep me up at night and get me really, really excited. And I find that uh, when I look at the, especially the gas chromatography for land race strains, like Colombian Gold 72 Pheno, not only does it taste different and act different. You look at the numbers, it's like, I know the names, but that number shouldn't be next to that chemical. So, you know, ask the turkey question. No, I completely agree. And I think that those of us who've been doing research on cannabis for a long time realize that most commercial, whether you call them sativas or indicas, when you do uh, cannabinoid testing, the ratio of THC to CBD doesn't change. Yeah. It's, so whatever difference it is between the strains that we all love, why one works for you, one doesn't, probably has more to do with terpenes, certainly that seems to be what's pointing the way, than even the minor cannabinoids. Would you guys agree with that? Do you have anything to say in terms of terpene production and some of the taxonomic analysis you guys I, are doing? I would agree with that. There's a lot of work that isn't published yet, but showing there's uh, real groupings to terpene profiles, and those groupings are matching varietal names, pretty much. You know? yeah. This is, uh, is going to be important for people choosing what they want in, in the future. Uh, one thing you asked earlier uh, was where did CBD come from? And like Don say, people are trying a harlequin or just pull that one out, or canatonic or something, a, a drug variety that's a hybrid that's high in CBD, and crossing them with hemp. And hemp has CBD without and not THC, and it matures earlier, and there's lots of breeding reasons to do this. But the CBD is coming from the drug side. Well, how did that happen? I mean, all these narrow leaf drug varieties, what? I wish people would call indicas. Um, they were predominantly high THC. There's very little CBD in them. And then breeders essentially bred CBD out of our recreational varieties. And it was came into us along with Afghan. 
Afghans are hashish varieties. They're not grown in single plant selections. All the ganja cultures, the marijuana cultures, there was somebody in that culture who selected the best plants and kept the seeds. That's farmer's varieties, land races. That all broke down when commercial ag agriculture started to feed the North American marijuana habit. And anything that was grown was saleable. Okay, these old guys were out of a job. Every seed got planted. So overseas land race areas, things got very highly deteriorated. Then we went back and added our modern varieties on top of it. That's the final blow. There are land races left. You're more likely to find them in a old hey, old cans than you are in nature, for sure. But this is where we need to start working again, like I was saying before. The CBD came back to us through Afghanica, okay? And then people start breeding it up as well. But you can't breed it out completely, and now people start looking for it, and lo and behold, it's still there in very few varieties. Rob, so would you, would you speculate that cultures that had land races that they were using medicinally probably maintained those at some significant level of CBD in there with the THC? No. I First of all, I, I look at this breeding as uh, entirely non-medical, at least for the history. Um, it, it, started, it probably started out as an as a evolutionary mutation that the narrow leaf varieties ended up without any CBD. They all have the potential to produce a little bit of one or the other. And, some favor of the sativa varieties really don't have much potential to produce any THC at all. But... But Harlequin's a sativa. Harlequin's a hybrid, bro. I know, but... He means the hemp sativa, European okay. hemp. Yeah, yeah. It's confusing. Sorry, so but when I say sativa, I mean, I I mean hemp. Yeah. What, what you guys are calling sativa indica hybrids are indica afghan hybrids. They're both indicas. It's subspecies indica hybridizes subspecies afghanica and the whole mishmash in between. You have indica, narrow leaf drug, phenotype, strong in that in that way, and you have other phenotypes that are strong in the broad-leafed Afghanica side. Yeah, but there are very few pure, pure ones of either one left these days. And, and if people want to read more about that, you can find Carl Hillig's work online, Hillig, H-I-L-L-I-G, and if you look up Hillig, cannabinoid terpene, terpenes, He's done some taxonomic analysis. That's four, that, four papers, basically, yeah. that Mark and I base our a lot of our uh, evolutionary hypotheses on. It's really it, great. It's amaz amazing work, and uh, and you can access it easily online. I want to ask you guys a broad question: Do strains even matter in the future? I mean, we've got now we've got extracts, CO2 extraction, fractionalization. You can recombine cannabinoids and even terpenes and any uh, kind of variety that you want. So why do strains still matter at a time when extracts are dominating the market in uh, Colorado? They're starting to dominate elsewhere. Uh, what's the future of this in terms of uh, strain breeding, strain analysis, even genetic analysis? So, I mean, one thing everybody should remember is that the way that humans first took medicine of any kind was as a really complex cocktail of molecules that you get from some kind of plant. And so cannabis has always been giving us this combinatorial set of molecules that interacts with the combination of molecules that line our endocannabinoid system. So we have all these different receptors in this system that produces balance in our body. And then this plant produces this library of molecules that combinatorially interact with that system. So the whole modern medicine thing of finding useful plants and then get rid of, getting rid of them and distilling it down to one molecule, that's not how we evolved treating ourselves for things and so I mean the whole extraction thing at this point for a long time has been kind of a delivery vehicle for THC it's been people sort of on their own trying to get back to Marinol and the extracts that we see that are really amazing now are whole plant extracts that preserve the natural terpene profile of individual strains and it is possible that we'll get to a point where people are pulling out all the different molecules, recombining them in their own combinations. But the fact is each strain is a unique and incredible combination. And there are aspects in there that people who people are pulling out terpenes, doing CO2 concentrates where they feed the terpenes back in, and you get four or five compounds. 
but the plant has hundreds of compounds perfectly balanced. And I think for that reason, we're always gonna want, or for many years at least, we're gonna want what's unique about strains. I don't think we'll be able to recreate that for a long time. That's a good point. You wanna to add to that? Yeah, I was just gonna say, everybody likes flowers. There's always gonna be a demand for flowers. For breedings going now, it's gonna be a lot of boutique breeding in the recreational market. Uh, and whether we're isolating cannabinoids, terpenes, or anthocyanins and things like that, you know, there's always going to be the need for the breeder. I, I think uh, I'd add to that. I think that the next big revolution, as uh, different jurisdictions open up their laws and import and export becomes possible, is going to be looking at terroir because it's one thing to grow your great Jama Jamaican genetics in your basement terroir. and say this is great Jamaican pot, but if it's not grown in the Jamaican sun in the Blue Mountains, it's hard to say it's Jamaican at all. Got a little Jamaican dirt in it too, that's yeah, terroir. Yeah, exactly, that's terroir. That's the wine revolution, that's what's happened with coffee and with chocolate, and I think cannabis is going to be the same once the laws allow for that as well. So, uh, in terms of strains, anything else to add on that? Don, or that out at the table, DJ? Well, from my lawyer point of view, strains are everything. The uh, strain is what protects your medicine. The, the medicine is a medicine because you produce it consistently and having your strain is how you produce your medicine and keeping your strain to yourself is how you keep other people from imitating your medicine. And, you know, in this country it's a little messed up because you can't really trademark or protect your strain. So it's been a free-for-all. This is good for getting things started. We're seedless, so, you know, especially at Industrial Hemp. We are really caught with our pants down. But in the long term, it's kind of bad for development of better strains. If cannabis is going to be a, a huge market, it's going to take developed, improved strains. You know, they turned corn from 1937 to now from 35 bushels an acre to 200 bushels an acre. We could have done that with cannabis too if we had these 100 years. And um, so strains are really important and protecting them is, is really kind of everywhere else in the world but here. Well, it's interesting because we are seeing in Oregon and otherwise, we're seeing some strain protection, some breeders' rights going in, right? So there is some effort to do that, particularly for hemp growers. You were going to add to that, TJ? Yeah, I mean, basically, why can't it just follow the same model as tomatoes? There are, there's medicinal qualities from tomatoes that can be extracted and pulled out and concentrated and whatnot, but I'm still going to want to grow my romas to make my sauce out of, right? So, you know, roses, tomatoes, whatever. <coughs> All right, I'm going to turn it over to the audience, see if there's some uh, questions here for this amazing panel. I'm going to go over to Dominic first and see what he's got to share with us. Thanks, Philippe. I actually want to get back to the question you asked them, which was actually about strains, and started to actually talk about it in the way that I heard Robert Clark talking about it, which is that taxonomically, strains are unsupportable. And so the importance of strains if it's based upon an insupportable, uh, you know, biological fact, means that taxonomy of strains that we have is irrelevant. And like, what, how does the market adapt to actually like, how does it even get beyond the indica sativa sort of dominance? Like the market's gotta be able to kind of respond to it. That's one thing. And in terms of strains, especially here in Washington State, you know, like most of the stuff that people, put on the shelf, you know, this isn't from a stabilized seed, a strain as, any, as, as you're thinking of it, you know, this, it's from totally amateur uh, accidents uh, that people decide to call, you know, like whatever word strikes their fancy that day. Yeah, I think uh, to put it another way, if white, wa white Widow helps with my migraines and I'm buying White Widow over here and it's this White Widow, how do I know it's the same White Widow when I go to, to uh, Massachusetts and get that White Widow? Do you guys have any response to that? Whether there's any even truth to the strains that we've that we've split out and named and that we find so popular. You know, Blue Dream's the most sold strain in Washington State. What does that mean? Is, is there one Blue Dream? So, we've sequenced about 1,500 varieties now, and I we do indeed have eight distinct clusters of Blue Dream on the genetic map. <laughs> but one of those clusters shows that it's the descendant of DJ's Blueberry and Super Silver Haze. And because we believe those two stories, of, of, of the millions of stories that we don't believe, 
That's the real blue dream cluster. And we're going to be able to genetically identify strains, so in the future, we will know what's what. And it's true that because people don't stabilize their seed lines, there's, instead of there being a thousand strains, there's a million strains. There's, they're just all children of parents. They're as unique as all of us. But every now and then you see clusters where people stabilize something and it became unique. And strains have scientific meaning. So if you look at um, broccoli and cabbage and kale and kohlrabi, those are all um, one species of plant. It's brassicus. They were all bred from a wild mustard called brassicus. But it's one species. Those are all one species. They're individual cultivars, strains of one species. And that's how diverse you can make a species by selective breeding. And so cannabis is going to converge to strains that really, really have meaning. It's those clusters. They're really interesting to me. You're saying those, those, those clusters, clusters are essentially are sure. what identify the strains as we would like to speak of them. Sure, but... So you what, know, is, what names do we give those clusters? Well, Jerry's going to add to this. So I'm going to jump in here. The reason we have an Althea project at LeBlanc is that Analytical 360 was kind enough to give us a month worth of cannabinoid terpene profiles. And a person I met here at HempFest two years ago is a big numbers guy at Microsoft. He unleashed Python libraries looking for pattern recognition, machine learning, artificial intelligence. They had whispered in our ear that when people fill out the application for a sample and they look at the results, they know what it is and 40% of what comes across the counter is counterfeit. The machine learning software didn't know this. Four popular strains April 2013. Blue Dream, Girl Scout Cookie, something else in Harlequin. Sadarshan has this videotape he did from it. He's laughing going, guess what? There is no pattern among the three rec strains. Harlequin, all of them cluster. And it was the terpenes that gave it away. So in our parlance, we don't think of the genotype or the phenotype. We're looking at the chemotype as the fingerprint of what's really going on. We went back to John Brown, he goes, of course. You didn't ask me to tell you if what you put on the form as the strain name was true or false. And the counter to that, and you Seattleites will get this. You tell me how a strain named Beast Mode showed up the day after the they made the playoffs. There's no way in hell there's a Beast Mode strain. So my counter is, not only are people lying for rec, not for Harlequin about what they've got, strain names are brands. They are nothing to do with botany. Nothing. They are brands. If it sells, that's what I've got. If I have to lie, or if I was lied to, that broken taxonomy is perpetuated for a end and of soapbox. You need to take into consideration, too, the environmental influence on any given specific strain. You can take an identical mother plant, the exact same genetics, send it out in 12 different environments, and end up with basically 12 different medicines coming back. So that there factor are. needs to be considered as well. Yeah, not just not just terroir, but also technology. Because oh, can I get this mic on? Right. Not just but technology. And at, at a time when we're finding that the distance from a light can affect terpene production, so that you get different terpene productions in lower buds than higher buds. I mean, the variety then ends up being massive, and you can change your plant's chemical profile by altering the light frequency and the light distance. So. Any more questions here from the audience for this amazing panel? Can you make one more comment oh, about yeah, the terroir absolutely. thing? One thing that we've done, we do a lot of, most of our groves are outdoors. What I found here in Washington State, it's interesting to look at the same clones or clones from the same mother and overlay my co-grow partners with a map of the wine regions of Washington State. Because the soil, the climate, and the water acts on grapes just like it does on cannabis. So whether you're in California, Colorado, Washington, or wherever, talk to your wine growing vinter buddies because they're doing the same thing you are and terroir is real. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, what's going to happen, we hope with strains in a while, is it's going to be the same thing. You're, you're going to go into a shop and, and you're going to say, oh, that's lemon haze. Great, that tells me something. Yeah. If it's genetically tested, we know it's lemon haze. But what farm is it from? What vintage is it? That's I agree. going to tell you a lot more. Yeah, at, 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 uh, in the Canadian system, we're, we're 
by regulation, we have to list THC and CBD uh, in terms of the, the strains that we sell. But we're also testing right now for 15 cannabinoids and about 20 terpenes. We're going to start listing those as well. So at least patients start to know what it is that they're using. And doctors can have better confidence recommending one strain or one treatment over another. So I've got a question over here for you. Hi. Um, I help to name this panel. And in my mind, rather than thinking of protecting rights to... Uh, making money on and the rights to strains in that way. I'm a patient that has strains that I've been breeding that I feel are important, but I don't necessarily want to be a, a licensed you know, person or a producer or whatever. But these strains are very important to me because they work really well for me. And so I'm curious because I know in Canada they are not, or the government after licensed places became popular and, and, and licensed, then they didn't allow patients to grow. So in Washington State, that's also been happening, and I don't want to see this happen. So my question to get breeders and people together, how important are all the strains? Should patients, I mean, help me here. I really think it should be like tomatoes. And um, Mowgli, um, you mentioned the uh, cannabis... Um, the open cannabis project. Open, open cannabis project. I'm really curious about this. We, we, I heard he was speaking yesterday. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, you're identifying these genetically in the hopes that then, once they are identified, will become public domain. And That's right, so we, it's, it's hard, right, because there's, we have two goals with this project. Um, one is that we want to make, we're giving them our data for all these strains we sequence, so that they can prove that these strains have been around, they're prior art, they're public domain, they can never be patented. So it, it just draws a line in the sand and, and says no big company can come in and take patient strains and patent them and restrict them, ever, because it will be this big wall of proof. And the sun just shone on us for the first time in two days at that statement. So it must be true. And, and can, can I add to that, please? Um, this really uh, struck a bell for me because you know, I, I'm curious about this whole phenomenon unfolding as it is. I have no intent. I don't want to own my strain. I don't want to patent it. But my biggest fear is that someone else will take my work and prevent me from working with it. And I see is the only solution to this is to making all of this public domain and open source. Yes. Yeah. I think that you pose an interesting challenge because the entire seed industry is based on disseminating genetics, and yet, of course, you want recognition for DJ Shorts Blueberry. I completely understand that, and from the sense that you deserve the credit for, for making that. It's not the only blueberry out there, but your blueberry is unique in those characteristics. But there is a framework for handling this. Um, the original um, Charlotte's Web R4 from Greenworks was released under a Creative Commons software license. I'm a nerd. I write open source. I write open source cannabis software. Greenworks released R4 under a Creative Commons of CCBY 3.0 by attribute. They had right of first refusal on any breeding that you did. They set a suggested cap price in the marketplace, but it was released as intellectual property not as ones and zeros, but as DNA, and it was released under a CCBY 3.0 license. You have legal protection, but patients can take it. They're not ripping you off because you've deliberately assigned that ownership to the public. I think that's fantastic, and I think that that's a way that we can all, as so this DJ evolves, we can use technology in our favor, right? So under, under, under that license, DJ would get credit for, by attribute. I can call it blueberry milkshake, but I have to give him credit. You know, and that, and, and the terms of that credit are spelled out in his license. I can be an asshole and a thief. No law will stop that. But if he wants to share it with me, he can set terms. So you know, the fine line that we have to try to walk as a community with no laws governing intellectual property for cannabis, the government has not kept track of that. They're not issuing cannabis patents. And until it's descheduled, yeah. they won't. So we have an opportunity as a community to structure it the way we want. And so the fine line we have to walk is stopping companies from patenting strains that are out there that they have no rights to, but also finding a way to protect and support breeders who have gotten the short end of the stick forever. And if we don't help them get licensing fees, we're not gonna support continuing diversity. So somehow we have to lean on Creative Commons type licenses, build a community structure where we 
band together and we, and we pressure big producers to be good citizens, pay licensing fees to breeders, and not try to patent stuff that already exists. It's interesting because Mowgli, as, as researchers, when we publish data, uh, you share it with the world, but the, you get credit for it because you get a publication credit. And I think that that kind of system, which is open-ended and allows some diversity and some sharing, while also recognizing the innovators of ideas, is maybe a good way to look at this as well. But the culture needs to embrace that, that acceptance of the breeder's efforts. Yeah. We all know who DJ is, yeah. and you know, but but if he sets a, a well, if he sets the, the, the framework for how he wants to share his creative efforts. He's rewarded for continuing to do the work. Yep. Well, we grow blueberry at Tilray, and we really appreciate your work, DJ. <laughs> how, how do you see our federal government just having given a patent to GW Pharmaceuticals for THC and CBD as a cancer cure? I'd like to know what store that sold at, because I go buy a bunch. Um, it doesn't even exist. It's a lie, but they got a patent on it. How do we deal with that kind of stuff while, while we're trying to implement what you're suggesting? I don't think any of us know the answer. <laughs> Darn. Well, well, you don't see them in your closet trying to make sure you don't grow the two varieties and combine them in your kitchen, right? This is the, the intellectual property is much more about trying to put it in the medical market and sell it commercially. And nothing that anybody's done so far is stopping anybody from doing anything that we're doing, which is a lot. So, so one, good thing about, <laughs> one good thing about GW is that they, they do use whole plant extracts. And so and that's an acknowledgement of the fact that you need the whole plant. And I think it's just important that people use the fact that they're having their success marketing pharmaceutical pills like that. Um, we don't let the government say, okay, now that's done. We don't need plants anymore. Instead, we use it as a huge validation of whole plant medicine. Most insurance companies aren't going to cover that. We've got to grow our own versions. Yeah, and some are starting, which is the great news. Hi, I have a related kind of question. Um, do you know that you must know the national members of the National Institute of Health have patented virtually all medical uses for cannabis. And so what is going to happen, you know, on that line, and, and uh, you know, they're probably going to farm it out to their favorite industries. I think the question is, well, I, I, I think they've got a couple of patents, not on all uses, but there are some government patents. So how do you stop the government from being the first in line to patent all of these potential therapeutic applications at a time when they're not even recognizing therapeutic applications? Call them under hypocrisy. <laughs> Yeah, it's not that they're not recognizing therapeutic applications, but you have to have some clinical verification that it's actually working. You can't just make claims anymore, which is good. You need to show some experimental results. Uh, it's still going to be like a, a gold mine. We've got all kinds of trolls already, hundreds of patents filed in cannabinoids by patent trolls who are going to try to slow down the industry for the next 75 years on these claims, or, or 20, 19 years or whatever it is. And, and it's, it's a boondoggle caused by 75, 85 years of prohibition. And, and getting us out of this is going to be really difficult. Guys, I really want to thank everyone on this panel. Uh, great IQs, great expertise, and uh, great innovation coming from these folks. Got a big hand for the folks on the panel. We got uh, Mowgli Holmes, Robert C. Clark, Cherry Whiting, Sonny Chiba, DJ Short, Don Warshafter. Uh, yep. Yeah. And, and I'd like to invite you all to go to the Knowledge Hut for, uh, uh, spend a few minutes there for people to ask you some more questions, maybe sign a few books as well. Thank you guys so much for uh, joining us on HempFest. That was a fascinating panel, guys. Much appreciated. And uh, we've got some great musicians coming up. That is uh, it for our panels for the day. The sun is out. Go enjoy HempFest.